<laughs> because that's a cue for me. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as you as you can see, we have we have already discussed this. What we're going to do? It's actually a reassurance for the members here. <laughs> <laughs> so how how much of CIAI has uh, has engaged in this? CIAI also has. Uh, I, I saw that uh, it was uh, um, uh, advertised quite a lot um, from uh, from CIAI. Uh, um, yeah, CII has a very good uh, system of uh, mailing all of their people with the press of a button. It goes to several uh, lakhs, probably. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> yeah, I understand. And they have a very strong uh, committee on technology, uh, which is chaired uh, by Mr. Bipin Sondi. Uh -huh. who is the MD and CEO of Ashok Leland. Yeah. And he's going to give the welcome uh, welcome, remar welcome remarks, followed by me. And then I will be handing over to uh, Debashish and, and you for the fireside chat. Okay. Madam, Mr. Call, would you like to welcome Mr. Sondi? He's, he's on the... Yeah, well, he, 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 he's not showing his face or, or no, no. his... No, he'll sound. show his face. Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, there he is. Hi, Vipin. Hi, Vipin. Hi, Rajiv. Hi, how are you? Very Hi. Hi. I, I like the way he changes because last time when I saw it, he had the Siam background. He's the president of the Siam, which is the yeah. Apex Automotive Association. Uh, uh, of uh, perhaps the the largest in terms of size amongst associations, other than of course uh, CII, but as an industry, specific industry association, it's extremely uh, large, and it uh, has a very strong influence on 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 CII. But welcome, uh, welcome, uh, Bipin, welcome, lovely to have you. Uh, nice to see you, Rajiv. Thank you for inviting me and uh, namaste to, to all, all our colleagues. Yeah. Good you. to see you, Mr. Sony, here outside the uh, Technology Innovation Committee. Yeah, of course they wish. Of course they wish. So our speaker is also here, Dr. Somak Rai Yeah. Nice yeah. yeah. to meet you, Dr. Chaudhary. Very pleased to meet you. I'm glad you can be here. I, I, and uh, so, on behalf of CII, I, I, there must be a lot of people lined up on uh, because the the numbers uh, that are being quoted to me is very large. So I have to only come from CII. Uh, in addition, it's going to be screened uh, live on uh, Facebook and and on YouTube. So yeah. that that you know, just 900 people does not include YouTube and Facebook. Because uh, IPSA uses Facebook extensively, and we have a good following on Facebook. In fact, I, I, I shared this response with this um, announcement on my page. Okay. okay. But um, Namita, are we going live at 5.45? Namita? 5.53. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are going live. Huh? So are we, we are we already live in the sense let us know when we you know yeah. when you're when you're turning on the live button so that we know whatever we say is being heard by everybody. Yes, yes, sir. We are live already. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> That's why I, I pointed out that so Dr. Hirok has to log in. I don't see him here. Well, did you ask him to join earlier? He, oh, yes, he said by 5.45 he should log in. Uh, Give him a ring. Yes, I will. And, and, and Jamshi Dirani is not picking up uh, the thing. Jamshi uh, Dirani has Leone is calling uh, me. Bipin. Okay, Sorry? let me have a word with Leone is calling me, so let, uh, let me just tell her. So, Rajiv, uh, just to... Uh, Rajiv, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Yeah. So, how does it start? I, I know I have to give the opening address, but I just take off, or what's going to happen? Yeah, you take off. I think you say you know you're very happy uh, to, to get this uh, on, on behalf of what CII and its uh, Technology Council or, or whatever the appropriate name of your council is. You are happy to bring this uh, in partnership with uh, 
with the Indo-British Scholars Association, IPSA. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because CII members and other people, uh, IPSA is not, not that widely known as CII. So if you could just uh, pronounce uh, this thing um, uh, in, in the full name, Indo-British Scholars Association. Okay. So who's going to say countdown three, two, one? Uh, so well, uh, Ashish is if, doing uh, it. Ashish uh, said he's doing it. Okay. So, uh, uh, once everybody is uh, okay and uh, with your permission, I will uh, check and uh, then uh, with a very, very quick formal welcome of maybe 15 seconds, I will then uh, request you to take off. Okay, Doc. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Rajiv, Doc and I worked together for several years. Uh, yeah, and, and Ashish, uh, I think uh, our uh, fathers were known to each other and they were on certain government committees together also. Achha, I didn't know that. Oh. I, you didn't know that. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, my, my father has mentioned uh, very often. That's so, Dr. Hirak Sen has joined us also. He's, 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 he's yeah. I think Jamshi Dirani is not uh, joined us as yet, but. Oh, is Doc I coming, is it? Yeah, he, he had said he'll make, give a comment. He said very interesting subject and he'd be happy uh, to raise a question. So, in oh, fact, lovely. we were hoping he'd raise the first question or second question. But in his absence, I think maybe uh, Hirak Sen can, can, can raise their first question. We already have That's a okay. We already have Hiraka. a question, question answer box. And uh, I hope <laughs> I hope I, I already I actually will will address it anyway in my talk. Yeah. Uh, Ashish, three so, minutes, you know, six five fifty seven, right? Yes, sir. It is five fifty seven. Yeah. Yeah. We're about to start in a couple of minutes. Yeah. We, we have about 93 participants. Okay, 95. They will increase sir, in a while. In the early days of webinars, people used to come 15, 20 minutes early and wait. Yes. Now people realize that that is not necessary. Yes. So people, as usual, uh, you know, normal two minutes late always. They come. They're always late. It usually peaks after five minutes of start. I'm <laughs> <laughs> sure at the clock. Well, it's already 108, I see now. individual zoom adjustments. So Ashish, we can start in two minutes. Sure, sir. Sure. Or shall we? Uh, it is still two minutes to go. Yeah, after two minutes, I said in yeah. two minutes. Yes.
Yes, sir. Uh, with your permission, sir, should I start? Yes, please do so. So, a very warm welcome to the eminent members of the panel and to all the participants to this technology webinar. This technology webinar on the mysteries of black hole and where to find them. Well, it captured imagination of many of the uh, people who registered for it. But uh, I will take extreme privilege to welcome on uh, in the panel, Mr. Vipin Sonhi, Mr. Rajiv Kaul, Dr. Devashish Bhattacharya, Dr. Somak, Dr. Hyak, and Dr. Subhito. Um, and we look forward towards a very, very insightful and a great webinar. Uh, with this, I will now request Mr. Vipin Sonhi to please uh, take on and uh, give his opening uh, address. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. And namaste, everybody. Mr. Rajiv Kaul, president of the Indo-British Scholars Association, IPSA, and past president, CII. Dr. Somak Rechaudhry, director, Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. Dr. Debushish Bhattachari, vice president, technology and new materials business, Tata Steel, and chairman, technology and innovation council, IPSA. L ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of CII, I'm privileged to extend a very warm welcome to the esteemed panelists and the participants of this very interesting session today on mysterious black holes and where to find them. Black holes has always been a topic of mystery and has always fascinated and intrigued scientists and space enthusiasts, and I'm sure all of us today present. Just to set the context, NASA defines black holes as a place in space where gravity pulls so much that even light cannot get out. The gravity is so strong as the matter has been squeezed into a tiny space. This can happen when a star is dying. Such supermassive black holes are thought to lie at the center of most galaxies in the universe, and the astronomers are keen to decipher their key properties. A key feature of a black hole is, is its event horizon, the boundary at which even light cannot escape its gravitational pull, as the velocity required to do so would be greater than the speed of light. The early existence of black holes was predicted in early 1900s based on Einstein's general theory of relativity. Subsequently, scientists have come up with numerous theories such as the area theorem, Hawking's theorems, no hair theory, evaporation theory, and many more to understand the properties of these mysterious objects. And in a recently published study, British and Dutch astronomers observed that not all black holes consume their objects of desire in an equal manner. They all have their preferences and patterns. So we see that black holes are some of the strangest and most fascinating objects in outer space open up to a whole new area of research leading to very interesting observations from time to time. It is worthy to mention that in 2020, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to three astrophysicists for their work on black holes. And in April 2021, scientists apparently discovered the smallest known black hole in our Milky Way galaxy. It's been nicknamed appropriately as the unicorn. The unicorn black hole is roughly three times the mass of our sun and is located about 1500 light years while it may be the closest one to us, it is still far, far away. With repeated breakthroughs in science and research, scientists across the world continue to discover some fascinating facts on black holes. But these exotic objects still pose many questions that beg for answers and motivate future research. Not only questions about their inner structure, but also questions about the theory of gravity under the extreme conditions, their formation and stability. And with these remarks, I'd like, I would now like to invite my friend, Mr. Rajiv Kaul, President, Indo-British Scholars Association, IPSA, and past President, CII, to share his thoughts on the subject. Thank you, and over to you, Rajiv. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my dear friend, uh, Vipin. Uh, it's great to see you, albeit virtually uh, twice in, in the same day, but it's, it's a great pleasure to be there. And uh, may I welcome all the panelists, uh, all distinguished panelists. I think perhaps I'm the only one who's uh, not a PhD and a doctor, but uh, it, it's good to be 
uh, among such distinguished uh, sort of uh, uh, such a distinguished panel. And of course, we have uh, uh, many, many, many actually one of the highest number of uh, uh, sort of participants uh, in this uh, uh, webinar. So welcome to one and all. Uh, this is CII's uh, first program with IPSA, or rather IPSA's first program with CII. And I would like to put on record my formal thanks to uh, CII, who of course I've had the pleasure of being associated now for uh, almost uh, four, four decades. Uh, the subject is indeed uh, most interesting, very, very fascinating. And my colleague uh, Devishish Bhattacharya, who chairs the uh, uh, IPSA uh, Technology and Innovation Council came up with this brilliant idea, no doubt in um, sort of conversation with his dear friend and colleague at Cambridge, I think, uh, Dr. Somak uh, Roy Chaudhary. And I think it's, uh, it's really a fascinating subject. And we all uh, look forward to learn more about Cosmos's uh, greatest mystery, the black holes. Vipin, you have given a little bit of uh, introduction to the subject. So I won't dwell on it a little more, but let me use the two minutes I have to give a little uh, plug-in for CII, for those who do not know CII, although it's extremely well known as the premier uh, industry association in our country. It's 125 years old. It's got members, whether they are public sector, MNCs, large companies, or medium and small companies, 9,000 direct members altogether, and 300 thousand members indirectly uh, through our uh, regional associations and of course industry uh, associations. Uh, we also have 62 offices in India and eight uh, overseas. So that's the little plug-in that I am doing as a former president of, of CII. But coming to my present role as a president of IPSA, we, we were inaugurated on 8th January 1997 uh, and we'll be celebrating our silver anniversary. We were inaugurated uh, by the Right Honorable John Major uh, when he came to Kolkata, in fact, for the CII Partnership Summit. That's when uh, IPSA was, was, was launched uh, by, by him. Uh, we are a registered society and we have a membership from both corporates and, and uh, individuals. Uh, we do a lot of... Uh, subjects on education, uh, training, uh, collaboration, knowledge sessions. Uh, we give scholarships and do other CSR activities. And of course, we do uh, cultural and social events. But all these are substantively linked or have some connection uh, with the UK, be they individuals or corporates. Uh, in today's case, we have two PhDs uh, from, from Cambridge. And it's really nice. Uh, to have them with us. So without any further ado, let me welcome uh, everybody, panelists, and all the people uh, listening in to today's uh, fascinating uh, webinar. And with these words of welcome, I hand over to uh, Debishish Bhattacharya for moderating the program, chairing the program, and indeed uh, engulfing us in a nice, uh, side chat with uh, Dr. Sabak Roy Chaudhary. So over to you, Devishish. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Call, and thank you, Mr. Sondi. Um, eminent panelists, all the uh, viewers of today's program, welcome to the first joint event of CII and IPSA on science, technology, and innovation. It's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to have Dr. Somak Roy Chaudhary amongst us. Many of you know him, but still, it's, it's, it's my privilege to introduce the speaker, uh, the, my, co my, my partner in the fireside talk to you. So Dr. Sumo Krajudri is currently director of the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. He was an undergraduate at Presidency College, which was then Presidency College, Kolkata and uh, at Oxford University, UK. After completing his PhD at Cambridge University, UK, he crossed the pond, joined the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics at, um, in, in USA, 
where he was working with the team that created the Chandra X-ray Observatory for NASA. He then crossed the pond back, retraced his steps back to, U, to, to the UK and was a professor at University of Birmingham. And he further traced his path back to his alma mater, Presidency, now University, where he was head of uh, physics, uh, head of physics and dean of science. And currently, of course, as I've said before, he is director of Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. Dr. Sumok Rajudhari, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and honor for us to have you here today in the, the, at the first session, joint session on, uh, on science and technology and innovation between CII and IMSA. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful uh, introduction. I hope I do <laughs> justice to it. Thank you very much. So the audience would like to know more. Yeah, they'll mange more, right? So, so, you know, from time immemorial, humanity has been looking at the skies and being bewildered. You know, they, they have been looking at those sparkling objects moving around and trying to see if they are, they have some influence on our lives. They have been looking at those stars and, well, they didn't know whether they are stars. They didn't, saw them as sparkling objects and they wrote rhymes, right? But then in the humdrum of today's life, we hardly look at the sky anymore, right? Um, so what in, in, this, in this century, in this day and age, attracted you to astrophysics? Well, I, that, that's a very good question, and, and, and thanks very much for asking me. And, and, and uh, let me also uh, thank you for inviting me to that. There are lots of people here um, who um, I, I really admire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sondi, also for uh, giving such a great introduction. You were almost giving away my talk, and, and, and Mr. Kaul for that introduction. So, Devashish, the, the, I think, uh, you know, I mean, what attracted me to the subject is something that would attract uh, many people. I mean, I, I have not met a single person who I've talked to who does not, uh, who's not interested in astronomy, interested in the skies, the stars, etc. And if you think of long time ago, before television, there was no entertainment after dark. People looked at the sky and everything happened in the sky, right? So this is why people have so many stories about constellations, say they come into our folklore, they um, look at things that are changing in the sky and, and build various things about it. They were afraid of the sky, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the entertainment. And of course, stars were the, the means of navigation, um, not just on, on by ships, but also on land. You wanted to go to a village. You knew where the sun was, where the stars were, et cetera, et cetera. So astronomy has played a very important role in our life. But there's a difference between astronomy and astrophysics. And that is, I mean, first of all, when I you know, on the train, meet somebody and I say, I'm an astronomer, everybody's interested. They, they just say, oh, wow, that's fantastic. But half of them think I'm an astrologer. And they ask me, you know, to read their hand or something like that. So there is a distinction may, need to be made between astronomy and astrology. I do not believe in astrology. I do not think the stars um, can actually control us because they're too far away, too weak, etc. But the interest comes in a different way. And that is the following. I've always been interested in detective stories, for example. And if you think of a detective who had arrives at the scene of crime a few weeks later, the body has been removed, half the um, clues are gone, very faint things remain, and they have to piece together the story from it. And that's what an astronomer does. Because we, um, you know, in contrast with the engineers or, or um, physicists, or biologists who work in a lab, I cannot go to my subjects. I cannot touch them. The only information I get from them are these sources of light that come, maybe in X-rays, in gamma rays, in, in optical light, now gravitational waves, et cetera. And from these very faint, very faint uh, information, sources of information, I have to piece together what that star is and how far away that is and what that galaxy is. And I ask, you know, imagine the audacity of the astronomer who, based on the little bit of science we know on the Earth, has been able to ask the question, how old is this universe? How old is the earth? How, you know, um, and, and stuff like that. And we can even answer that. That is, that, that's, that's the romance of the subject. And that's what attracted me from the very beginning. It is like a detective. It is the ultimate detective story. And here, technology and innovation plays a huge role. And this is why we are here today, I think. Because an astronomer is nothing 
without technology and innovation? Because it, to answer every single of these questions, we are pushing the boundaries of knowledge and we have to invent things. And, and, and you'll see in my talk as well, how you have to invent new things and uh, think innovatively in order to put these together, just like Sherlock Holmes had to do. Right? And so this is what, what always attracts me to the subject. And that, that is, we are kept on our toes and it requires every ounce of uh, resource to answer even the basic questions. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Rajoudhuri, for for answering that. And you brought out the romanticism of, of, of the subject, and uh, and why not? You've spent your uh, you're spending your lifetime dedicating it to the subject. So, just a follow up question on that. You made a very pertinent, um, interesting point from the business perspective, or the user perspective. You said stars were used for navigation. So, all these heavenly objects sparkling away, they have real life use. So, oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, 2000 years ago, 2000 years, somebody has to use the, I, I think there is a, it's me. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, 2000 years ago, um, stars served as navigation aids to us, right? And, but then they have not, I mean, even though I say I do not believe in astrology, stars play a very important role in our everyday life in the sense that, as I said, in order to study them, we have to push technology in directions, in many, many, many directions. And so what comes out laterally are things that we use in real life. I mean, just look at your phone. You have a digital camera in there. And the digital camera was invented so that a telescope could go in space and not have to develop film, right? the main sensors for, for the space telescopes turned into your digital cameras that's in your phone now. You have the GPS system, radio communication, mobile phone communication comes from development in, in, in radio communication, which is essentially originally done by radar astronomers, uh, radar physicists and then radio astronomers. Then, I mean, the entire subject of physics comes from a question of um, Edmund Halley who went to Newton and asked, why do you think the comet comes back? And then Newton started thinking and developed the entire subject of physics. You see, so you ask one question, you get something else out of it. And in every single thing, in single thing that we're going to talk about now, where we are pushing technology to understand the stars, all that technology is producing other things that eventually come back to, um, to our use. It was an astronomer who developed the MRI and three-dimensional imaging that we use every day in, 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 in medical technology now, right? So, um, so that is, that is the, the utility of astronomy. I'm not saying that that's why we should do astronomy because there's the, the wonder in it as well. But, uh, but once you pursue this, then you know that, that you will always, because you push technology, you will come up with wonderful things that you can use. Great. Now we can't wait to listen to you on black holes. The screen is yours. Okay, so let me share my uh, share my screen and 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 start talking about black holes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so um, I, as I said, I mean, I'm going to talk about black holes today, and I know there are also already in the question answer box a lot of questions. I hope um, I can answer uh, many of them. Um, uh, black holes are. Um, I've always, you know, I mean, people have been fascinated with the sky and black holes come in, in fiction, in films, and in a lot of ways, they, um, um, they attract our imagination. And a lot of that is, is to do with terrifying things. Black holes are out there to get you. No force from this world can stop it. These are Disney movies. These are Hollywood movies, science fiction. And you can see black holes are terrifying, right? And one of the things I would like to do today before I end, is to make sure that you understand that black holes are not only not terrifying, but they're really friendly things, very interesting things. And it, you know, unless you go very near them, they are wonderful, right? There's nothing to be afraid of. So let's start from the very beginning. I'm going to uh, uh, assume that you know nothing of the subject, even though already in the, in the introduction, a lot has been said, but uh, I'll just, and then if you, if you find uh, familiar things, please bear with me. I'll start with Newton. And all of us have gone through school in which Newton's laws were, were taught to us. And we know that Newton uh, uh, found gravity 
to be one of the forces in nature. Actually, it's very interesting that Newton came across this thing during a pandemic year, just like the year that we are going through now. In fact, Cambridge University was closed for a year and a half during the plague, in which all students were sent home. And Newton was one of them, a second year undergraduate at that time, sent home and he went and lived with his aunt in a big orchard, with a big orchard that, um, that had some apple trees in them. And under those apple trees, he spent his afternoons and evenings thinking about things. During that year and a half, he discovered calculus. He invented the binomial theorem, one of the basic things in, in mathematics. And then he understood the laws of gravity. And this is how he formulated gravity. You know the story of the apple and stuff like that. And that was as an undergraduate during a pandemic year. So often we, we talk, when we talk about what the effect the pandemic is having on us, we often say, are we suppressing people like Newton who would have otherwise had time to think away from university as it were. So Newton um, formulated gravity as something that is always there between any two objects that is mass and is, is, uh, is a pull between, so between two objects and it's inversely proportional to the distance between them. So uh, the earth is going around according to Newton sun because there's this invisible string that's pulling it, the force of gravity and uh, the pull of the sun on so something far away like Saturn is, is less than that. But that's the, that's the basic crux and it's universal. And that leads to this very interesting idea, even for Newton, um, uh, from Newton, we know that there's something called the escape velocity. In order to escape from something, something, you need a minimum velocity. So for example, if you want to launch a rocket from the earth, um, actually it doesn't work that way um, so simply, but um, if you want to launch a rocket, you need exactly that kind of uh, velocity at least, and you need to go above it, right? And that's because the kinetic energy has to be more than the energy due to gravity, right? So, and, and, and so black holes, you can understand from this, you know, we now know, Newton didn't know this, but we now know from Einstein that the highest velocity anybody can attain is the speed of light. And so if you take that formula, we can see mass is on top, the r, the radius is in bottom, something that has a, has a mass and a size such that the escape velocity from it is more than the speed of light, then nothing can escape from it, right? Because there's, you can't go faster than the speed of light. Actually, Newton did not know that because for, to Newton, there was no limits to the speed of light, but to, to speeds of objects, but, um, but he knew that light speed is very, very large. And so even in Newton's time, people speculated what would happen uh, once, once Newton published his theory, what would happen uh, if, uh, if, if, for example, the escape velocity was more than the speed of light. So how can you do that? What you can do is, for example, you, you, can, uh, you can make uh, uh, this, if you look at this formula, it's a very simple formula, which says that it, it depends on this combination of mass and radius, right? So this escape velocity from the Earth is, uh, is something like uh, 43,000 kilometers per hour, 11 kilometers per second. Um, it's not something that, for example, I can break with my car. In fact, the police will catch me till I, if, I, if I manage to break, break that, that speed limit. So this, it's much, much higher. And that's why it's very hard to break that speed barrier and, and, and take rockets away from the Earth. For the sun, that is 2 million kilometers per, per hour. And that is, um, th that's why the earth is trapped in the sun, right? Really, the escape velocity is very high. You can't really escape from it. Now, how can you take that escape velocity and make it higher than the speed of light? This is how you can do this. You look at the combination mass over radius. It just means that either you make something very, very massive, or you scrunch it such that its radius, which means its size becomes very, very small. So that tells us that anything can become a black hole. You and me, we can become a black hole. But then our radius has to be scrunched to a certain size such that the escape velocity from us becomes higher than the speed of light. And you'll see that that is very small. So for example, for the Earth, for the Earth to turn into a black hole, it has to be squeezed into a size that is less than a centimeter in radius. Now think of how difficult that is. 
And often in the headlines you find, you know, in CERN, this famous, uh, you know, experiment is turned on, it might turn the earth into a black hole. But, you know, look at how hard it is. Can you think of any process that is going to take the earth and squeeze it in the size of a marble, right? So the earth is not going to become a black hole. The sun, for the sun, that radius is three kilometers. It's like a small town. The entire sun has to get in there. And it turns out that kind of thing is possible. Actually, for the sun, it won't happen. We know that. We, don't, we know that in order to squeeze something to that, that kind of size, we need to have much bigger stars. But for stars, that is possible. And so on the, on the left, I can show you, this is the formula for it, for people who are mathematically minded. Later on, after Einstein did all this work, we now know that if I take something of mass M and squeeze it to the size 2 gm over c squared, c being the speed of light, then it will become a black hole, right? So that's how I got these numbers. How did I get that? So what happened to do this? I need to go back to Newton again and tell you one thing, and that is, Newton's laws were taught to us in school, and Newton's description of gravity was taught to us in school. And for many of us, that is the last bit we hear of gravity. What we don't, nobody tells us, is that Newton's laws don't work beyond a certain uh, uh, limitation. It works very well for, um, for, for uh, everyday life. It works very well even when we launch rockets that, that we, uh, Newton, Newton's laws use to, um, to uh, go around their orbits, et cetera. But when something is traveling very close to the speed of light, then this entire formalism breaks. And this is where Einstein comes in. So what Einstein did was Einstein realized that Newton's laws were not the entire story. In fact, the way we learn it in school is it works, but it's not right. It's actually not right. Einstein was a very precocious young, young man. And even at the age of 14, 15, when he was in school, he lived with his uncle who was a physics teacher. He was asking him questions like, what happens if, I, uh, if, I, if I'm traveling at the speed of light with a mirror? Can we see myself in that mirror? Will light be reflected from it? Things like that. And then he realized something very profound at the age of 15. And that is Newton's idea cannot be right, because if two things are moving very fast, very close to the speed of light, and it's supposed to be attracting at, along the line joining them, then how does one object know which direction the other one is? Because it's already moved by the time that information has come to this, right? To, to Newton, this wasn't a problem, because in Newton's case, everything was instantaneous. This information that I'm pulling something doesn't need to travel at a speed. Einstein, at the beginning of the 20th century, said nothing travels at infinite speed, no information. There is a limit to the speed at which even information can travel, right? And that is the speed of light. And so you cannot really describe gravity as if it's like an invisible string that's connecting two objects. It has to be something else. And Einstein came up with a revolutionary idea of gravity. And that is gravity is not a force. So what you learned in school is not right. And actually what gravity is, is I'm going to tell you in a minute what Einstein said. So Einstein actually gave us this whole formalism of gravity that works even when things are moving very fast, close to the speed of light. And you understand why I'm here because I already told you that in order to describe black holes, I have to have things that are traveling close to the speed of light because you know they escape velocity has to be very close to or higher than the speed of light. And I cannot describe black holes in the very simple way that I, that I did at the beginning in terms of Newton, because in terms of escape velocity, that formula, et cetera, because that formula strictly does not work if an object is so compact that the, the, the velocities around it go very near the speed of light. So Einstein gave us this formalism that uh, of how to do it, and I, I'll describe that in a minute. But I, I need to bring in two other characters in this story. The second character is, is this man called Carl Schwarzschild. What happened was Einstein published his, his new theory of gravity in 1915. Uh, it, it, it was during the First World War when um, the English speaking world was at war with Germany. And so that German paper 
describing gravity came out in a German journal and the English speaking world did not know about it till the war ended. Actually, it came to India before it went to England. Um, and uh, that's another story. But Karl Schwarzschild, who was a mathematics professor at Göttingen, was fighting for the German army uh, in the war. And he had access to Einstein's paper. He solved Einstein's entire equation for what we now call the black hole. He found out what will happen or under what situ situation would a star be such that light cannot escape from it. And that's what we call the Schwarzschild radius, the radius, the size of a black hole. That formula that I showed you was found by this man. In fact, he wrote in a postcard to Einstein saying, I found your dark stars. I found the star from which light cannot escape and what, what space would look like um, around a star. Actually, by the time the postcard reached Einstein, Schwarzschild was dead in the war. He, he was killed in the war. But Einstein published his paper, and, and then people understood what will happen to a, if, if a star collapses to a size light escape from it, right? But nobody knew how to make a star that way. That was given to us by this man. In the 1930s, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar, who uh, went to Trinity College, Cambridge, to do his, his doctorate degree with Paul Dirac. Before going there, he visited Kolkata and visited his maternal uncle, C.V. Raman, uh, for a couple of summers. And there, in C.V. Raman's library, he started reading in the astrophysical journal this whole problem of black holes forming. How, how would you form a black hole? How would you have a star become so small, etc.? And he applied this new thing of quantum mechanics that he had learned from his uncle um, to, to this problem and told us exactly how a black hole would form. So these are the three main characters which, which actually form the basis of, of this. So what is this, this notion? Let me just go there first. So Einstein told us that the way to describe gravity is not a force between two objects. Gravity is actually an effect that any massive object has to space itself. In Einstein's theory, space has a character. In Newton's theory, space doesn't exist, it's vacuum. But from Einstein, we know actually space exists and space has a geometry and space can get curved because there's a massive object in it. And the more massive an object, the more curved the space is around it. So here you are, you have the sun and space is curved around it. And that is why the earth, which also has a little curvature in space, but it's trapped in that large curvature of space. And it is going around the sun, not because the sun is pulling it, but it's because it's trapped in that curved space and it can't get out of it, right? And in this formalism, even light going by a star can bend, right? So that's a very new way of looking at it, looking at gravity. And, and this solves this problem of how does one know each other I mean, about the force on it, et cetera, because gravity becomes a local effect. It doesn't need to get that signal from something far away. The earth feels the curvature of space. It's like a trough, space itself is bent and it's trapped there. So it's a local effect, right? Now this has had a profound effect on, the, on physics in the last hundred years. We've now started looking at the world in, in these terms and you'll see some effects that come out of it. So there you are. So I told you, Einstein suggested that what happens is space curves around massive objects. And if you have, if you take that massive object and squeeze it into a small space, space curves even more around it till you, it becomes so curved that nothing can come out of it. It's like coming out of a well. You need a lot of energy to come out of that well. And a black hole is just that object for which the curvature of space is so much that nothing can climb out, not even light, right? And in the middle, so, Another interesting thing is because there is this horizon around a black hole called the event horizon, nothing can come out. We know nothing about what's inside a black hole. We know, of course, if something has turned into a black hole, all that stuff has fallen in, but we cannot see it. So I see questions in the question box asking, what is inside a black hole? We don't know. We don't know the state of matter inside the black hole. We can't because no information comes out of a black hole, right? Now, the actual, the, the singularity in the middle, 
the in, in the middle, the, the density of that black hole becomes really infinite. And we don't know how to deal with such things in mathematics. And so it was mentioned that this year, last year, the physics Nobel Prize was given for black holes. And Martin Rees essentially pointed out that the black hole, the, the half of the Nobel Prize was given to Roger Penrose uh, for, for finding out, starting really to understand how, what happens inside a black hole and how that singularity forms, but should, should have also give, be given to Stephen Hawking, who, um, of course, the Nobel Prize is not given to people who have died, and he passed away a few years ago. But it's really the, the work of Hawking and Penrose that started to describe and has not, has not stopped. We haven't understood what's inside a black hole, but it gives us the mathematical formalism of how, what, what is there in, in the middle of the black hole. And I thought in, in passing, I should mention that in the description of what happens inside a black hole and how the black hole itself uh, inside the event horizon, how, how, how it, is, it is configured, comes from these two people and this, this set of papers that start from 1970. But it is based on work that was done in India, based on work that was done by Amul Kumar Rai Choudhury in Kolkata. He was actually my um, head of department, Presidency College, when I was uh, an undergraduate. Amul Babu's work um, in 1955, he published a set of equations which come from Einstein that forms the basis of the PhD thesis of Stephen Hawking. It was Stephen Hawking who called um, the, these set of equations that I chose the equation. And on the basis of that, people have started understanding the singularity. So this year's Nobel Prize essentially goes all the way back to the right choice equation. Uh, you know, since there are a lot of Indo-British scholars here, let me tell you that when I, I studied at both Oxford and Cambridge, when I, when I studied in Oxford, I went up to Roger Penrose, uh, his professor of mathematics, and asked whether uh, he, uh, he would let me attend one of his classes. And uh, that, in, in that particular uh, thing, he asked me, so what's your name, where are you from, et cetera. I said, my name is Rai Chaudhry. So are you, are, you, are you related to the great Rai Chaudhry? So I said, no, I'm, I was a student. And, and he then introduced me to the person sitting in his room, and that was Stephen Hawking. And both of them were then working at that time, the early 80s, on the right Chaudhry equation, trying to figure out singularity. And in, in, the, in the various papers that came out, the lectures came out. In fact, then I went to Cambridge and took my first, my first course on black holes was, was with Stephen Hawking. So um, this is this, and at a time when all this work was going on. So I'm very lucky that I was there when all this work was being done and I, we witnessed it kind of um, firsthand. So coming back to this, this whole notion of then what happens is that the black holes form. Now, I just, I just said, please don't think about black holes are, are being terrifying because black holes are there. They're very interesting to study. And, um, and black holes, unless you go very, very near a black hole, nothing happens to you. I mean, if, if for example, the sun does become a black hole today and it won't, then nothing would happen. No planets will fall into it, for example, because the black hole that the sun would turn into, its effect doesn't go as far as the planets, right? And so, so that is one, one way of time of calibrating how close you have to go um, to a black hole for you to be sucked in and things like that. And science fiction and all these movies so show very other things. They're like, black holes are coming to get you and things like that. So why is it difficult to observe these black holes? Because as I said, you have to really turn a star into such a small, um, small uh, thing. And so, you know, a black hole is very difficult to see. So uh, may I ask a yeah. question here? May I come in, please? Yes, of course. Yes. So this is fascinating, you know, uh, where you have just uh, said what you've learned in school about gravity uh, needs to be relearned, right? It's, it's not just a, a, a string, the direct connection, like a string connection between two bodies. And uh, Newton was only a sort of a special case of Einstein. In a way. So, but anyway, we still land man on moon using Newton, right? So that works. But come into this picture, uh, having seen space warp uh, around heavy objects. So black hole is black. And when, he, when, when, when we go into a dark space or dark room, we are uncertain about where the objects are. And even when the objects we feel, we don't know what exactly they are, you know, like the proverbial elephant where you touch, a, touch its trunk and you feel, you may think it's a snake or you touch its tail, you may think it's a rope, the, the, the legs may be tree trunks, etc. 
how on earth, or maybe how in the heavens, do you know what you're seeing or, or what you're sensing? <laughs> so first of all, let me tell you one thing. You, please do not think that Newton's laws, the fact that Newton's laws fail, uh, they fail in certain places, um, does not affect us in real life. We use Einstein's extension of Newton's laws every day. Everybody does. For example, if you use your mobile phone, uh, the question can you mute your uh, mute your? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry about. So, uh, if you use your mobile phone and it has a GPS and it tells you where you are, that is using Einstein's um, general relativity to make uh, make that calculation, because the way the GPS tells you where you are, and you on Google Maps you can see yourself. It is sending signals to three satellites, and at least three satellites, and they're triangulating you. Now, in all, by calculating the amount of time it takes for that signal to come back. In order to do that, because the satellites are sitting in the Earth's gravitational field and space is curved around the Earth, then it takes slightly longer than what Newton's calculation will tell you. So unless you apply to GPS, apply Einstein's correction, you're off by about two to three kilometers. So it can't tell you where you are now, right? So we are using, if I have a mobile smartphone, I'm using Einstein's theory every time. Anyway, so going back to your question of how, so this is a black hole's picture, right? And that's why, because in order to see a, a black hole, and that's why I said, how do you find, find them? You have to have some light coming to you from, because I told you at the beginning, our way of studying the universe is to study the light that comes from things. And, and if no light can come out of a black hole or not even reflected off a black hole, then how do you see it? And the answer to your question is, is what I'm going to come to next. And that is, you, you can only see a black hole. You can't see a black hole, but you can only feel a black hole from the extreme nature of its gravity. So uh, in Bengali, we, we have this expression, which means that you can't hide fish with leaves. It's going to rot and you can smell it, right? So you can't have a black hole sitting there in space and not feel its extreme gravity. So you have to go near it somehow. You have to see things that are near it and try and figure out. And this is the next bit of the story. And this is the next, also the other half of the Nobel Prize this year, which, which um, told us how, for example, you can find the black holes. So now we know that there are, um, so I'll, I'll tell you stories of, of finding black holes of various kinds. And so there are essentially two kinds of black holes. There are, there are some things called stellar mass black holes, which means that black holes that are a few times the mass of the sun. And these come from, um, from stars, stars that collapse to form black holes. What happens is that a star is essentially a nuclear reactor. It's, it has nuclear fusion in its middle, like the sun has, and nuclear fusion goes on, 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 and heat starts coming out, light starts coming out, and there's an equilibrium between the gravity that's trying to crush it and the light that's coming out, and its thermal effects. Once that nuclear reactor in the, in the middle of a star finishes its job, which means that all the fuel is done, then there is no equilibrium, so the star can only collapse. Right, and this is what we call the death of a star. And if the star is is massive enough, Chandrasekhar showed us that it will collapse to something called a black hole. If it's not massive enough, then there are quantum mechanical effects that stop that collapse, and it can turn into something called a neutron star, or white dwarf, or various kinds. I'm not going into all that. But so stars collapse to form black holes. So the most massive star that we see in our galaxy is about 100 times the mass of the sun. So you can expect the, the black holes that form such, from such things to be a few times the mass of the sun, maybe 10 times, 20 times, something like that. So these are stellar mass black holes. And then there are these black holes that are called supermassive black holes, which is there in one per galaxy. In each galaxy, there is only one in the middle. And these are a million times, or even a billion times the mass of the sun. We don't know where those things come from, but our galaxy has one, and that's the next part of the story. And now, and people have always thought, so what about you know a few times the mass of the sun and a million times the mass of the sun? What about in between middle mass black holes? They have not been found except for the fact that 
about a month ago, we first found uh, the evidence of a black hole that is about 150 times the mass of the sun. And, um, and, and so this is a new subject and I'll talk about it right at the end. So let's talk, first look at our galaxy. Our galaxy, the universe is made up of galaxies and the galaxies are, are the basic building blocks of the universe. They, each one of them have a few billion stars, 10 to the power nine, 10 to the power 10 stars. This is our galaxy, which we call the Milky Way. And this is what it looks like. If you look at it, this is not a photograph, of course, because we live in it. But um, so this is an artist's impression. If you look at it from the top, you can see that uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has these spiral-like features and the sun is not quite at the middle. If you look at it from the side, you can see it's flat like a, like a chapati, like a pizza. And in the middle, there's a bulge and you can see the sun is not really at the middle. So this is where we are, right? And the sun is about 25,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. And it's going around the galaxy. It's now, it's actually gone around in its lifetime 20 years, 20 times already. It's going around like that, right? And the earth is of course going around with it. Now, from here where we are, we look at the sky and all the stars we see in the sky are in this little thin layer that you see here, right? Because we're looking up. If we look out this way, if you look towards the center of the galaxy, we can see a whole path of stars on the sky. That is why it's called the Milky Way, or in, in Indian language, it's called the Akash Ganga. It means it's a river in the sky. So that's what, that's what we see. So from India, we don't see really the, the Akash Ganga very well because the earth blocks it. You really have to go to the Southern hemisphere to actually see it in all its glory. And if anybody's here been to the Southern hemisphere, you know that you can see the Milky Way going on in the sky. But if you're looking, so I told you that there is this supermassive black hole, very, very massive black hole right in the middle of every galaxy. So there is one here. And from here, we have to find it. We have to look at it. And that's what was found and measured. And that led to the Nobel Prize this year. And I'll show you how much this Nobel Prize was for engineering and technology as it is for, for physics, because you had to do a lot of innovation and, in, and, and technological development in order to get there. So how do you first, there are two things that you, that, that you need to know in this story. One is, if you look at this galaxy, you see in the plane of the galaxy, and here we are, you can see the sun, and we're looking towards the center, there is a lot of black stuff, and that black stuff is dust, real dust. And that dust comes from when stars are formed, they leave behind a lot of dust and that blocks light. So you have to look through all that dust if you're looking through to the center of the galaxy. And the second thing is that you have to look very, very close to that black hole, absolutely near. So this is what it looks like in, in if you take a, and so the first innovation that was done was that in order to look through all that dust, one had to develop um, infrared sensors because infrared light can go through dust. It is uh, transparent, dust is transparent to infrared light. So here's an infrared picture of the center of our galaxy. And you're looking at all these stars. Of course, we don't see the black hole. The black hole is where that arrow points. We don't see it. But you can see that there are a lot of little stars near it. So now, if you can look at how those stars move, then we can figure out how massive that thing is that's in the middle of our galaxy. If you measure how fast planets move around the sun, you can measure the mass, mass of the sun, right? Now, actually, this thing is so massive in the middle of our black hole that stars around it move like planets. They move very fast. So this is, this is what we are trying to do. There is another very interesting effect that you have to beat, and this is where the innovation comes in. Stars twinkle. Why do stars twinkle? Because all the starlight comes through the atmosphere to us, right? Now, the atmosphere, at, at, at a height of almost 100 kilometers, it's changing in, in density, pressure, temperature all the time. So the light that comes to us, you can see that, see, you have a telescope here and the light from a star comes like that. And it's coming through all these layers and it's zigzagging all the way. And the way it's, it, it comes on a camera or on a plate that you're observing or even our eye, it, it, it goes like that, right? And so this is why stars twinkle. And so if you take a picture, which, possibly lasts a few seconds or minutes or hours, you have an exposure, then the star's, star's image would have moved in that time. And that is why the image is blurred. So it turns out if you want to measure the motion of the stars around the black hole in our galaxy, you have to do better than that. 
because you can't have this blurring due to the atmosphere because that blurs out all the stars and you don't see very near to the black hole. You have to go very near in order to find how fast things are moving. And to do that, you use telescopes like this. So this is the largest telescope in the world in Hawaii, the two telescopes, Keck. And they're 10 meters in diameter. And you can see that this telescope is made up of segmented mirrors, the 36 mirrors that make up this, 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 tech, uh, this telescope. And in real time, in one hundredth of a second, you can change the shape of the mirror. This is called adaptive optics, wonderful technology. And so there is some other telescope that's measuring how, how this, uh, these stars are twinkling and giving, because you can completely computerize it now. And these 36 mirrors together, their shape changes such that focus remains exactly the same. So you can beat this effect of the, of, the, of, of, the, of, of the atmosphere. This is called adaptive optics. This is done all the time. In fact, we have a wonderful adaptive optics lab here in Ayuka, and, and we are doing this. Uh, and, and so what you do is by compensating for the atmosphere's um, uh, um, uh, uh, turbulence, you can, you can uh, do exquisite imaging. So this is what, for example, the place near the black hole in our galaxy looks like. It would be totally blurred at two microns in, in an infrared imager. So you have to first develop the infrared imager and then the adaptive optics. And, and once you have the adaptive optic system, you can see you can actually see the stars. And that's where the black hole is, right in the middle there, the, the, the dark bit, right? So what did these guys do? So these are the two groups, uh, Andrea Gess at uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, and uh, Reinhard Genzel at Max Planck Institute in Germany. Their groups use two sets of telescopes, one in Hawaii and one in, in Chile. These are the four telescopes in Chile. And they did exactly this from the 90s. They started looking at the stars around the black hole in the middle of our galaxy. And what did they find? This is what they found. And these are pictures of real stars now, color coded. And you can see on the right here, it says 1995. You can see every night you're observing this place. Now where this big star asterisk is, is where the black hole is, which you don't see. But now see that by measuring the positions of the stars around the galaxy, around the center of the galaxy every day for the last 25 years, they have mapped out the orbits of all these stars and they're moving like planets around the sun, right? So you can see it again. And all these stars, and, and these are real stars now. And you can see that they have nice little orbits around the black hole. And the black hole you don't see, but who cares? Because you can see the stars moving. And from the motion of the stars, you can use normal physics, Kepler's laws, it's called, to take, take, take SO2. This is my favorite star in the center of our galaxy. It has an orbit of 15 years. It goes around the center of the galaxy in 15 years, like planets do, right? And from that, you can use now for those of you who are physics minded, you know Kepler's laws, you know how they're used. So you, you, can, you know that uh, something going around on the object uh, has an elliptical path, like the planets do, these stars are going around the black hole and, and that's, that's where the black hole is. And these two groups mapped all these, um, the, the stars going around like that. And then, you know, you, this is my, uh, my math page. This is from 15.2 uh, from years by mapping this, um, this, uh, um, this orbit of the star around the black hole. And that's the black hole there, Sagittarius A. They found that it is uh, four times uh, 10 to the power six, four million times the mass of the sun. That thing is hiding right in the middle of our galaxy, right? And it's so small that the star that's going around it come so close as um, uh, almost the, the size of our solar system. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's in a very small space and it can't be, not, can, can't be anything else. It's really a, a, something that's a million times the mass of the sun in such a small volume, it has to be a black hole. So they measure not only the mass of the thing, but also the size of the thing. And that's what, um, that's what got them the Nobel Prize. So that's one way of, so I told you that, you know, there are these supermassive black holes in the middle. So this is one way of finding them. So at the beginning, at the middle of all galaxies, there's a supermassive black hole. Our galaxy has something that's 4 million times the mass of the sun. There are others in which I have studied, which have maybe a few billion times the mass of the sun, 10 to the power seven, 10 to the power eight, but every galaxy has one in the middle. But Throughout the galaxy, in the billions of stars that there are, many of these stars 
have turned into black holes. How do you find them? And so the rest of the time, and I have another 10 minutes, don't I? So um, uh, I, I, I'm going to, um, Devashish, I have another 10 minutes, don't I? Or something like that. Something Maybe, like that. Something like that. Okay. <laughs> Let me, it'll, it'll be overshooting the seven, but that's okay. We might be overshooting a little bit. I hope you don't mind. But uh, I know that there are many questions. Now. That's it. So I'm going to talk about uh, two uh, ways of, of finding the other people. Yeah. So um, one is, so this is, uh, so let, let's think about stars. So in our galaxy, actually most stars, more than half the stars, um, are in binary systems. They are two stars that are going around each other. Our sun, our sun is, is single, and that's unusual. Most planets should have two, two suns in their sky. Remember that. So uh, like Tatooine in Star Wars. So normally the two stars are going around each other. And of those, one star will be small, another will be big, right? Normal. So it turns out in astronomy, bigger stars, more massive stars, actually end their life faster because they burn up their fuel faster. So here in this system, think of these two stars and one of them has, has finished its fuel, it's blown up and its center has collapsed into a black hole, okay? So now we have a normal star and a black hole. They're going around each other, right? This is a very common scenario. So once that happens, now later, a little later, maybe millions of years later, but in astronomy, millions of years is a little later, uh, the other star is going to now evolve because it's now it finishes its uh, its, its fuel and it's now going to what the, what stars do is they, they they expand become very red and cold and and so it, it it grows to become what is known as a red giant and this black hole is so close to this star that it starts attracting its outer layers to it and that stuff falls onto the other star right now because the two things are rotating around each other. The angular momentum is there, and so things can't go straight into the black hole. It can have to go and then circle around the black hole and slowly fall in. So that's what's happening. And it forms a little disk around the black hole called the accretion disk. Now, this disk stays around the black hole for many, many, for a long time. It could be hundreds of thousands of millions of years before the thing falls into the black hole. And, and this exists around the black hole, and the black hole has such strong gravity, this gets very hot. So the matter in this accretion disk, we can calculate is about 10 million degrees hot, 10 to the power seven degrees. So what happens if you heat something to 10 to the seven degrees? Laws of physics tell you that it emits X-rays, right? Normally, if you have stars like the sun, which is a few thousand degrees hot, the sun is 6,000 degrees hot, it emits real light, light that we can see, yellow light. Something that's a million degrees hot or 10 million degrees hot emits X-rays. So this is why we have to go and look at this this stuff to look for these things, the black holes and the matter around them with X-ray telescopes. This is why this subject is new because of the following reason. What are X-rays? In the electromagnetic spectrum, X-rays are things, so this is the visible light right in the middle, and X-rays are things that have um, much smaller wavelength, much higher energy. So, and the other problem is that the atmosphere is not transparent at X-rays. So all the X-rays and ultraviolet rays are stopped by the atmosphere. That's very good for us because otherwise we'll have can skin cancer, right? The ozone layer stops the X-rays. So if I want to find these, um, these black holes, I have to send a telescope, an X-ray telescope into space. And then there's another problem. You can't really focus X-rays into a picture because you know X-rays would go right through. That's why we, you know, we take X-ray pictures of the insides of our body. So X-ray mirrors have to be very special. In fact, X-ray mirrors are built such that X-rays come and they strike the mirror at grazing incidents, not like that. And that's how they're slowly then concentrated into a, a, a detector, right? So we had to invent X-ray telescopes and we had to send them to space. And we couldn't have sent them to space earlier than 1970s, right? So, the, I was introduced as, as, the, as part of the team that, that, um, that worked on the Chandra Observatory. This was named after Chandrasekhar, who suggested that black holes can exist. NASA launched this in 1999. 1999 and this is the observatory that has given us, given us the best pictures of black holes till now. And it's found black holes all over our galaxy and in other galaxies as well. And it's a great observatory that, you know, it, it, it has this amazing orbit of 64 hours. It goes very far away from Earth because 
the, the surroundings of Earth has a lot of charged particles, and you have to get away from it in order to observe in X-rays. Not just the atmosphere, it has to get, go very far away from Earth. And you can see it goes 100,000 100, kilometers away, and it comes back. And we observe the rest of the sky when the, the, the observatory is very far away from us. Okay? India has now built a similar X-ray telescope. It's called AstroSat. It's been up there for five years and is built in the Tata Institute and our institute and in Bangalore. And ISRO launched it in 2015. And it's got five telescopes. One of them is an ultraviolet telescope. And there are three telescopes that are, are, are X-ray telescopes. And we have a fantastic observatory built entirely by ISRO that observes the space. Um, in, and so this is how you, know, you have these X-ray mirrors concentrating the light. That's the, that's the one in Chandra, the mirrors. That, uh, that concentrate light into uh, X-ray detectors. That's the X-ray emitter from AstroSat, our own satellite. That's very similar to that. And you can nest them because you know, X-rays are, are being concentrated, not in normal incidence. So I'll give, you, I, I'll give you an example of how we can find these black holes from my own work. So here's a picture of a galaxy, which is not our galaxy, a nearby galaxy called Centaurus A. Okay? And this is a normal picture taken with a small telescope from the earth and all you see here are normal stars, right? No X-rays, optical light, right? So all the stars that you see here are a few thousand degrees hot like our sun. So we took Chandra, the Chandra X-ray telescope that, uh, uh, that, that we worked on for so long and we pointed it to this galaxy and for a long time, for a million seconds actually, and got this picture. In this picture, everything is more than 10 to the power 7 degrees hot, 10 million degrees hot. In this picture, everything is a few thousand degrees hot, right? Now you can see in X-rays, and all these things are stars in that galaxy that have accretion disks that are 10 to the power 7 degrees hot around a, around, around a black hole, or some, are, some of them are neutron stars, right? So you can see these black holes. But you can't see the black hole itself. You can see the matter that's around it, but it's emitting X-rays and nothing gets so hot other than the matter that's around the black hole. You can't have a normal star that's that hot, right? So this is, this is the way you can actually image black holes. I'll quickly talk about in the last five minutes, if I may, talk about how India is getting involved in all this. India has now en entered a phase where it is now entering big science. And this is where Indian industry is also getting engaged. This is why it is very important for a lot of this audience to know this, that in order to do this kind of study, the, the technology that's needed comes from Indian industry. These are the, some of the greatest uh, um, uh, worldwide projects in which India has now invested more than $100 million. The 30 meter telescope uh, will be built in Hawaii with India's contribution at 10%. We are building a, a gravitational wave detector in Maharashtra, entirely built in India. And we are hoping for the 3,000 crores that, will be, uh, that we've asked for for the government to be sanctioned any moment now, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll give you a couple of things um, uh, from these. That's a 30 meter telescope that's going to be built in Hawaii. It, I showed you the Keck telescope, 36 mirrors. This will have um, about 500 mirrors, uh, essentially like that, uh, in, a, in a configuration that is 30 meters across. And this is now can't be built by a single country or single institution anymore. Five countries are building it. Um, India is 10% of it. And uh, as you can see, um, Andrea Ghez, who I showed you with the Nobel Prize, she's part of this as part of the American contribution. Uh, and uh, well, I sit with her in many committees discussing how we're going to do this. And India is now building not just, uh, it's building 100 of the 400 meters in India. The entire assembly under the mirrors that's going to change the configuration of the mirrors to, for the adaptive optics is being built by Indian industry right now. It's, it's all being built in India. The entire software for the telescope is actually been written in Pune right now by three different companies. So this is the industry engagement in, in this kind of stuff. And this, once it is built, it, it, it's 2034 is when it's going to be built. Uh, is going to find these supermassive black holes in the centers of all these galaxies. And finally, I'll, I'll tell you about gravitational waves very briefly. Gravitational waves got the Nobel Prize three years ago. What are gravitational waves? 
I told you about Einstein. Einstein said that massive objects actually um, uh, distort space. He also said that if things move around in space, it causes ripples, waves in space. But he said you can never you never detect them because the, the the actual amplitude of the waves will be very very small. It turns out that it's about ten to the power minus eighteen meters for two black holes colliding. That kind of extreme uh, event can only you know vibrate space that little. So the question is, can we find them? And we did in two thousand fifteen the first event of two black holes going around each other and merging. The whole thing happening in about a fifth of a second was was detected by the two observatories. I'm not going to go into the detail of how these this is done in 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 the U.S. The, called the LIGO observatories, laser interferometric gravitational wave observatories, and they're three thousand kilometers apart, and both of them detected it, detected this event, right? And this is what it looks like. It looks like space itself is vibrating. And because the black holes are are coming together very close and merging, then the frequency of the of the of the vibration increases very fast. As you can see, the frequency increases, and that's the signature. The thing is, since the amplitude is very small of this vibration, we have to eliminate all kinds of other noise in the system. In fact, you know, people walking around in the in the, in the detector, for example, and it can detect very very tiny vibrations. In fact. We worried when this was found in 2015 uh, September whether we had detected a, a thunderstorm in Nairobi, right? Every single wave that crashes on the coast of the country can be detected by this thing, right? And we can detect uh, black holes colliding because we know the signature. So that's 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 how technology has advanced now of micro detection. Of of displacement, so this is an entirely technological feat. It has very little to do with physicists. So these are this is what so and what we found was that black holes of the size of states of India almost colliding. So the first one that was found were two black holes, thirty times the mass of the sun, colliding, coalescing to form a single black hole that was sixty times the mass of the sun. And if you apply that Schwarzschild's formula, it's the size of Maharashtra that black hole. So this is a, a very interesting graphic uh, produced by one of my students. So now you can see that recently I told you we found all these massive black holes, and the most massive one we found is about 145 times the mass of the sun. So now we're getting into an interesting, different kinds of black hole regime in the middle of stellar mass and supermassive black holes. In fact, that's the hole called the stellar graveyard. This is the times the mass of the sun. And those little purple spots are the ones that we found using Chandra, the X-ray satellite, and they are of the order of like ten, five, ten times the mass of the sun. But LIGO, through gravitational waves, is giving us all these things, right? Which are a few, you know, forty times, sixty times, eighty times the mass of the sun, and we've now found fifty such events in the last few years. The interesting thing is, we are going to build the third one in India, in Maharashtra, in the Hingoli district, and we're waiting for the government sanction for it. We already have bought the land, and the entire industry, Indian industry, is going to be involved in building this. It's going to have vacuum tubes, four kilometers long. That's going to have nanotor vacuum in it. It's going to have control systems that pushes all kinds of technology possible in order to do this. And once we have one in India. Then we can do a lot more than the two ones in America are doing, and I'm going to stop there. And I'll I'll just uh, put up names of certain books that you should read if you're interested in black. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rajagopri. I will be very careful in mentioning the proverbial elephant again. <laughs> so you you we we started with a fireside chat, and you've set our minds on fire, right? So just one. Final comment from you. You've showed how it can be measured. You show how you've shown how industry is involved. What is in it for the students? See, um, you know, you and I grew up. Can we uh, get this in the background, please? Uh, the screen okay. sharing. If we can close it. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, it's a very very good question. You know, I mean, uh, that's the crux of um, of, of the matter. 
I, I told you now India has got, gotten involved in this international um, collaborations in, uh, in all these sciences and it's pushing technology. That is so different from the India we grew up in. When I was an undergraduate, you were an undergraduate, we knew that if you wanted to do experimental research at the edge of technology, we have to go abroad. Now, I can predict that when LIGO starts working in India, and that's the first big international facility that's going to be actually built in India, or similar things that India is now involved in all over the world. In Hawaii, I didn't talk of the square kilometer array in South Africa and Australia that we are building. Indian students don't have to leave India. In fact, the Americans are going to come and come for their PhDs to India now, right? That means a lot to the young people. That means that we have the confidence now that our younger generation will come and do their work in India. They don't have to go in. We, we can show that we can do this technology. And as I said, this is as much a physics exercise as an engineering exercise, right? And students who are going into engineering colleges now can look forward to doing research in the country, right? And that is, that is seriously lacking, as you know, engineering research and, and, and physics research and things like that. So that, that's what's there for Indian students. And if I am growing up in this India, I, would, I wouldn't probably have not gone abroad, uh, you know, maybe gone abroad to get the experience, but I, I knew I would know that I can do this work sitting in an Indian laboratory in the country. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. It's, it's, it's really not only set our minds on fire, it also gives us hope. <laughs> so thank you. I, I'll, um, I know the time uh, is, is, is running on, and, but it's my um, honor here to ask some of the very senior members uh, from IPSA and uh, from CII to ask a few questions to you. Um, may I request uh, Dr. J.J. Irani, who is former president of CII, a patron of IPSA, former managing director Tata Steel, Padma Bhushan, and uh, Knight of the British Empire. May I request Dr. Irani to ask a question, please? Jamshed, you have to unmute yourself. Jamshed, if you could unmute yourself. Doc Irani, if you can unmute yourself, please. The host of the program can unmute him, I think. Yes. Pradeep, can you unmute Dr. Irani? It's fascinating to hear what has happened in the last 50 years since we were students. And we heard about black holes in a very detached sort of way. And now apparently, because of the availability of technologies, which can send telescopes beyond the gravitational pull of Earth, we can gain knowledge. I'm not in a position to ask any question, excepting to say that what benefits do we expect from these advances in knowledge? Over. Thank you. I, I, and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, um, this is a subject that I, uh, of course, is very close to my heart. And, and um, I think we had a little discussion at the beginning also about, about these benefits. The benefits, of course, to me as an astronomer is just pushing the boundaries of knowledge and to figure out, I mean, we ask the biggest questions like, you know, what is there uh, in the universe? How big is the universe? How old is the universe? And things like that. And, and that itself is, is uh, a pursuit of knowledge in itself. And, and uh, in order to do that, you develop tools in physics and mathematics and engineering to, um, to answer these questions. But for, even if you look at it from the completely utilitarian point of view, you see that there are collateral benefits that benefit everybody. So because we are pushing technology, we are also uh, developing new ways of uh, innovative ways of doing things, right? And uh, uh, so I, at the beginning, I talked about how the, you know, we developed the digital camera, the GPS system, 
you know, our uh, medical imaging system all as a path to understanding questions in astronomy, right? And so people didn't start out by saying, I'm going to develop the MRI or the GPS or the, or the digital camera. They started asking the questions, so how do I image uh, a star or a, or a galaxy from a space telescope and not have to, uh, you know, develop that, that film in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a chemical laboratory? And so the digital camera came into being, things like that. So I'll give you one more example, Dr. Irani. I'm very, very interesting because I can talk for hours on this, but we, I just talked about LIGO, right? So here you are, you're trying to, uh, to find a very small displacement of the vibration of space itself. And we want to eliminate all other forms of vibration. And so you have to isolate this particular, uh, particular observatory from its surroundings so much so that we can detect that. Right, and so isolation systems, vibration isolation systems, had to be devised like nothing before. So the same lab that developed the vibration isolation system for this for the LIGO observatory in Glasgow has now come up with a company that has spun off a, a startup that provides you know extreme solutions for vibration isolations for all situations. And one of them is, for example, your eye surgeon is performing surgery on your eye and at the same time think the building vibrates due to an earthquake it could ruin your eye but now they've made something that can that can isolate his arm from the rest of the the building and so it, it is a completely vibrationally isolated uh, surgeon's arm that's operating on your eye so see you know you start by trying to understand black holes and where you end up so this is I, this is one example of of trying to push um, push technology to its limits, and a lot of this is coming out. I mean, we have a whole list of such things that have already come out of trying to develop uh, the big telescopes and the big observatories like that, and and they some of them are being spun off into 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 wonderful products. Thank you. I feel very proud to hear that in India we are. We have developed to a stage where we can converse with and in fact challenge the rest of the world. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Irani. May I request uh, Dr. Hirok Sen, former president of IPSA, very senior member to ask the next question, please. Hello and good evening, everyone. What, what a fascinating conversation. Has been. And, uh, thank you, Dr. Samal, for very You me. said your interest into astrophysics came up from your interest in detective uh, novels and stories. I, I really think that you are a cosmic, <laughs> a cosmic fact finder, and and I am very serious when I say that to me you are like a sage who is trying to crack the most important mystery of creation and universe. Yesterday, I watched a video of, by you, which you did in October 2020, about one hour, 40 minutes long, with Stephen A. It is a lucid exposition of some of the complex theories of astrophysics and cosmology. Among others, it was of particular interest to me that you mentioned Mahabharata as a, as a kind of a time reference in that uh, talk. I'll come to Mahabharata a little later. I have two observations to make and raise two questions, and these two are related. First, black holes are, to my mind, a layman's mind, and I've been interested in this ever since my college days in St. Xavier's. Well, it's Calcutta, which is also your alma mater. Uh, black holes really are the central mystery of our age. A black hole is where the quantum world and the gravitational world will come together. Correct me anywhere if I'm wrong. A black hole is a single point called the singularity. Here, time stops. Here, light rays bend and loop around the hole. Black holes are the smallest particles in the universe, but 
they are surrounded by a dark halo, which can be large, and these are called event horizons. In his very important read lecture of 2016, Stephen Hawking said, we can't tell what's inside a black hole, which you have also said now. He also said that when two black holes collide and merge into one, the event horizon of the merged black hole will be greater than the sum of the event horizons of the two black holes that had collided. These are profound observations. However, Dr. Rajodhari, uh, I'm an engineer and like dear, I like to see observational uh, support for these profound theories. Uh, you have given many observational supports. And one of the important observational supports that have come up recently is the work of Shepard Goldman in 2019, when he captured the image of a black hole located at the center of galaxy M87, Marcia 87, which is 55 million light years away from the Earth, at some distance. The black hole image by Dolman is 6.5 billion suns compressed to a single point. Ladies and gentlemen, and Dr. Rajavari, these numbers simply numb my mind. To capture that image of that black hole, Dolman used many telescopes around the globe in a synchronized manner using atomic clocks. You know all about that. This is called an Event Horizon Telescope, EHT. So my first question to you, Shomak, is this. How do you envisage EHTs will progress and how much observational support will emerge during the next few decades. As far as I know, without being too personal, you are around 60 years of age. So you have probably another 30, 40 years of life ahead of you. So during your lifetime, how far do you think we will move in our understanding of this central mystery of our age? So that's my question one. And my question too, that's a short one. I feel in a layman's uninformed way that quantum physics and metaphysics huh? may find a common. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 go ahead. Uh, I feel that what <clears throat> quantum physics and metaphysics may find a common confluence in the future. For example, in the Mahabharata, which you mentioned, in the Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 11, Vishwarup Darshan, Lord Krishna gives Arjuna Divya Drishti. I wonder if this was an equivalent of an EHT, and reveals to him his cosmic form. Arjuna is overawed by what he saw. And in Sloka 16, he says, he says, I see in you, my Lord, no end, no middle, and no beginning. Dr. Rajudri, to me, this is metaphysics. When I look at Dolman's image of galaxy M87 and the black hole in the middle of it, I see no end, no middle, and no beginning. My question to you, Dr. Rajudri, is this. Do you see quantum physics and metaphysics meet at a confluence someday and thereby and therefore the destructive conflicts between various religions will diminish and the world will become a better place from that point of view. Thank you. Thank you so much. Question is, how much time do I have? I mean, you've asked me a question to answer that. I mean, it's so close to my heart, uh, these issues. But I could speak all night on this. So let me give you very brief answers. Um, we, we have time. We have time. The Event Horizon Telescope, um, of course, I did not talk about it today, but actually it, it has also detected and, and imaged the black hole in the center of our galaxy as well. And he just chose to uh, publish the M87 image first. And uh, um, this, is, this, this is a very resource intensive exercise. 
So of course, uh, I think we'll get the Nobel Prize in a couple of years. It, it's amazing amount of work. And uh, it involves a lot of telescopes around the earth. As you know, as, as you said, the radio telescopes can be combined together in, and they can be placed in various places and they can combine together to make a telescope that is the size of the farthest objects, right? This is uh, one, one thing that radio telescopes can do. So for example, there is a, one of the telescopes in the Event Horizon Telescope is in Antarctica and the other is in Europe, another in Japan. So they can, they can be connected so that the telescope effectively is the size of Antarctica to Japan, right? And that gives us the resolution. The larger the telescope is, the higher the resolution is. And th that image that you're talking about is a resolution of a million times better than the resolution that I showed you of the normal telescopes that we have on, on uh, single telescopes that we have on Earth. So now we are actually trying to put a telescope on the moon. So the tele size of the telescope will be moon to earth, right? And the future generation of the, uh, the event horizon telescopes will work with telescopes in orbit and telescopes on the moon. And so you can see how we are going to go. This won't happen in my lifetime. I do not have another 50 years left in my lifetime, but uh, maybe in another 10, 20 years, I will live to see the event horizon telescope doing the same thing for a large number of black holes. Um, but it takes a long time and a lot of people to do this. So thank you very much for bringing that up. And I think that's a subject that everybody should look out for. It started off as an image that, uh, you know, made it to the front page of all newspapers and it's going to give us sensational results. To answer your second question, it is a, a very important subject that the, the interface between religion and, um, and uh, or what we call metaphysics and, and physics. And there are some, there is some very good work that has been done on this. Actually, frankly speaking, there is no conflict between the two. And at some point people will find the, the nexus between the two. Father Lemaitre, a Jesuit priest, and those of who have been to Zen, Zen Zavius know what Jesuit priests are and what they have done to, to science. And Jesuit priests were there at the beginning of, of astrophysics. There've been some very, very famous astronomers who have been Jesuit priests. Father Goro, who taught us mathematics in, um, in St. Xavier's College, was a student of Father Lemaitre uh, at the Sorbonne. And in fact, if you have attended his maths classes, he often talked about, talked about, I'm sure you have, and he talked about Father Lemaitre. Father Lemaitre, and, and thank you very much, because this is, I mean, um, these are people who we have learned from. Now, Father Lemaitre, who was Father Goro's teacher in, at the Sorbonne, was the person who is responsible for our theory of the origin of the universe, the Big Bang. He solved Einstein's equations and found, and Einstein did not like it. There was a conflict between Einstein and, and Father Lemaitre. At that point, Einstein told Father Lemaitre, the universe cannot start from a point. It cannot, it has to be infinite. And Father Lemaitre, you are inventing this universe because you are a Christian. And the Christian theology says that the universe started from a point, let there be light. Einstein accused Father Lemaitre of, and Father Lemaitre said, no, this is what my mathematics is saying. My religion and my mathematics, my physics has no, they have no conflict with each other because they ask very different questions. Religion asks, metaphysics asks different questions and physics and mathematics ask different questions and they can coexist. And they, that is Jesuit tradition that's been there. And there are many other, I mean, in India too, if you look at the way people like Aryabhatta and, and later Bhaskara and Madhava approached science, they had, they had their metaphysics and their mathematics coexisted with each other. There was no conflict between them. In the modern times, if you read Paul Davis's books on, on religion and mathematics, you know, I went to Cambridge, if you, if you were at the same time, uh, I mean, Devashish was there. John Paul Kinghorn was the, was the master of Queens. He was a, a, an Anglican priest, as well as one of the greatest theoretical physicists. And I've, I've heard lectures from them and, and, and they, they essentially talk about how the quantum world and the metaphysical world can coexist and explain each other. We haven't come there yet. I don't think we have got there where one can talk about metaphysics and religion in terms of physics, but I, you know, I, a lot of the people who have reached to this level, including Stephen Hawking, um, I mean, talked about the connection of, of the information that's there in the universe, in the stars in the universe, and 
the 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 lack of information that there is as well, right? And and so there is in the quantum world the two meet. I think we are maybe a hundred years away, or maybe more, of of the resolution of this this paradox. And I thank you for bringing this to the fore. I think this is a very important thing. And a lot of people confuse them. A lot of people see conflict in them. I don't. Thank you, Dr. Sen, for the question. And thank you, uh, Dr. Rajiv, for the answer. May I ask uh, Dr. Subroto Pal to ask the next question, please, from the panelists? You are muted, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Rai Chaudhary, for an excellent uh, and a mind-blowing presentation on black holes. I'll do because I think time is running out. I'll keep a very short question. The question is, has the information paradox, which is one of the greatest puzzles of the black hole, has it been resolved? I'll uh, give me one or two minutes to explain this information paradox for the rest of the audience. Uh, you know, the information paradox, uh, the issue is that when a star collapses to become a black hole, it seems that all the information is lost forever. <laughs> But this appears to violate a bedrock concept of quantum physics, that information can never truly be lost. Exactly what happens to the lost information contained within stars when they collapse remain a mystery. Dr. Raichudu. Yes, thank you. I, I think uh, a lot of the questions in the question answer box also are asking this question. Thank you for bringing this up. The information paradox is a great challenge. Absolutely great challenge. And of course, as you know, towards the end of his life, Stephen Hawking was also working on this. And yes failed to resolve it. Um, of course, if everything is solved, we are out of business, I lose my job. Uh, and this is one of the, <laughs> the great things, great things about physics that once you solve something, more questions emerge. Right. And, and there is no end to questions and information about this one of them. I, I just said that, you know, you can, can't really, we don't have a theory of what happens inside the black hole. And the answer lies again, like the answer to the, the previous question in the quantum regime. We do not have a quantum theory of gravity yet. So gravity has not been quantized. We, for example, you know that electromagnetic waves have, have the fundamental particles which are called photons. And so we know the quantum nature of electromagnetic radiation of light. We don't know the quantum nature of gravity. We don't know at the quantum nature where it meets. So the quantum theory of gravity, people have tried a lot. In fact, Einstein thought he had solved it, he didn't. Hawking thought he'd solved it, he didn't. And we have string theory, for example, that's trying to do it. Ashok Shen is, is a great scientist in India who know, who's trying to bring the two together. Quantum gravity is kind of the holy grail. I think once quantum gravity is understood, only then can we ask, the, as you say, the information paradox, the information is expressed in terms of the entropy of a system. And that entropy describes the different quantum states that something can be in, right? And in order to describe all the different quantum states, that, uh, that matter can be in, you need a quantum theory of gravity. So we're waiting for a quantum theory of gravity to emerge from, from research. Uh, it's a very, very fascinating subject. In fact, I have many colleagues here in Pune sitting in this particular building who are trying to crack it. Um, but, but the information paradox comes directly um, from our, our understanding of the quantum nature of gravity. Right. And so in the next 10, 20 years, we probably see an answer. Einstein thought next 20, 10, 20 years, he didn't, right? So I mean, it's hard to know. <laughs> because as I said, as you solve one, one little bit of the puzzle, you know, the other bit of the puzzle kind of explodes. So then you have to put it all back together. It's, uh, that's the fascination of science. That, that's, uh, you know, you can never predict when. And tomorrow morning, I can, I, I'll get up and see a paper in the, in the journal that's solved it, that's cracked it. Who knows? Okay. It could take 100 years. Okay. Right. So we are talking about yeah, astrophysical like time here. Yeah. So what's yeah. 10, 20 years? <laughs> 10, 20 million? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> probably not. Oh, humans are not going to be around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll just take one or two questions from the audience. I know that we have run out of time. Any questions, yes. um, uh, You've seen some of the questions and some have already been answered. So there's okay. one which stands out, uh, which probably has not been touched upon. The question goes like this. Within a galaxy, if more black holes are formed, then where does the center move? Good question. So, you know, uh, the center, uh, what is the center, what is the center defined as? So the, you see the central black hole 
in the galaxy is a, a, a few million times the mass of the sun, right? Or maybe a few billion. 10 to the power 6 or 10 to the power 7 times the mass of the sun in the middle of our galaxy. The, the entire galaxy is 10 to the power 12 times the mass of the sun. So the galaxy itself is far more massive than the central object that's sitting there. And all these other black holes that are moving around in the galaxy are a few times the mass of the sun, 10, 20, 30, 40, and there might be millions of them, right? So as the black holes are forming, the star's mass is not changing though. It's just getting more compact, right? And so the, black, the entire mass of the galaxy is not changing as the black holes form. But as these black holes move around in the galaxy, the collective mass of all the black holes is much, much smaller than the mass of all the stars and the dark matter and everything else in the galaxy. So formation of black holes does not change the mass, the mass of the galaxy at all. In fact. And the, the amount of matter in black holes, the supermassive black hole and all the black holes in the galaxy is much smaller than all the other stars that there are. Thank you. We have spanned from um, from metaphysics to the utilitarian, or the other way around, from the utilitarian to the metaphysical. And everything is, as we know, everything that is born and black holes are born, as you say, as you shown, die. Hmm. So, do black holes die? Ah, uh, very, very good question. And actually, um, uh, so because something um, for, is for the black hole is formed. And nothing can come out of a black hole. So you might think that a black hole um, stays a black hole, right? Because unless you can take some energy out of a black hole or mass out of a black hole, how would it shrink or how would it die? Hawking had a very, very clever idea. And that's called Hawking radiation. In fact, it was such a clever idea and so approachable that he published it in Scientific American, a popular journal, before publishing it in a technical journal. Hawking radiation is like this. In quantum mechanics, it tells you that in empty space, um, energy can turn into matter. And the way it turns into matter is it creates a particle and an antiparticle, a proton, antiproton, electron, antielectron. And they together then can become uh, energy again. So imagine near a black hole, a simple a little bit of energy creates two particles and one goes into the black hole and the other doesn't. Right? So now you can see that one particle is coming out of the black hole. So this antiparticle going into a black hole actually diminishes its mass because the net effect is a black hole and something has come out of it. So this is a quantum effect. And you know I just said there's no quantum description of gravity, but this is a quantum description of particle and it has an effect on the mass of the black hole. So by this, a black hole can shrink, but only by a particle. So this is one way you can destroy a black hole is to wait for all the black hole's mass to diminish by emitting particles like this. It turns out that for a black hole, the mass of the sun, it will take 10 to the power 60 years for this to happen. The, the universe is 10 to the power 10 years old. That's a long, it's a very slow process. But yeah, eventually you can destroy a black hole. You have to wait very, very long. You know, I'm already getting hungry. You can, you have to <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajyotri. You know, it's been a fascinating talk. Our minds are on fire. Um, I have been a very bad moderator for not keeping to time. Uh, so I will not stand between you and your dinner and the audience and their dinner. I'll request, I'll request Dr. Ajit Mohan to propose a word of thanks, please. Thank you, Dr. Devashish. And thank you, Dr. Rajyotri, for what a fantastic and amazing very, very insightful and knowledgeable talk that you have given. Amazing, sir. I was just uh, making the notes throughout your lecture and I was uh, kind of appreciating the width that you have covered. You started from the Newtonian dynamics and calculus era and you took us from the escape velocity concepts to the uh, through the Einsteinian relativity theory. Then came this scar child radius, the amazing concept and the and then, of course, a uh, contribution from our, our very own Indian uh, physicist. And then what possibility India uh, has, what are the opportunities Indian astrophysics has in the coming years. Amazing, sir. I was particularly impressed, and I'm sure uh, audience and every panelist will agree, the way you have connected the concept of astrophysics with the industry-relevant subject, the adaptive optics specifically you mentioned was really a 
very connecting idea. And so you have presented a research of uh, the level of the uh, Nobel Prize winner's research in such a lucid way that laymen like us, I, I could get some grasp of it actually. So thank you for putting it in such a simple and fantastic way. Um, collision of black holes and the ultimate end towards it. So it remains a mystery, but definitely perhaps we will not be there for 10 minutes to past 60 years, but the knowledge window will expand its horizon to have the answers towards that. The mystery continues, but definitely on we are much more prepared than ever before with your wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Raj Chaudhary. I will also take this uh, opportunity to, to thank uh, uh, Mr. Vipin Sondi, who is chairman of Technology Committee of CII, and uh, Mr. Rajiv Kaul, who is president of IPSA and also a past president of uh, CII. Uh, thank you, sir. I will also thank Dr. Hirak and Dr. J.J. Irani for blessing us with their presence and their questions and interactions. Thank you, Dr. Subhita Paul, sir, for your guidance throughout the preparation of this seminar. And then how can I miss our very uh, dear friend, Dr. Devashish. Sir, you have uh, presented the concept in such a wonderful way that it was really interesting overall, the way you carried and conducted the session. So gentlemen, thank you very much. I am really uh, happy to share that we have already got some likes and following on the YouTube and Facebook. The participants are willing to ask more questions, which we will revert back to emails. And thank you participants for being there. It is the energy from participants only which drives the any webinar towards its success. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. We will keep connecting. The technology will keep us connecting. Thank you. Stay okay. safe. Stay home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Cannot revert to the one more. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, thank you. and Debushish and everybody else. Vipin, thank you for your support, CII support. Thank you. Tremendous. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very, very fascinating subject. I was hoping my knowledge would go from a scale of one to maybe seven or eight, but it's gone, I think, from one to three or maybe two and a half. So I have to, you know, yeah, so like many more times. Yeah, we've been talking about nine here. Millions and millions. There were about 100 questions. I'm just the, the, the last one was the killer. Was it 10 to the power 60, right? 10 to the power 60. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.